والزهد والكساد إنه نور تجلى ربنا الله تعالى British India, also historically known as the British Raj, occupies a very significant historical era in the history of the world. The rule of the British Empire over the vast estate and population in the Asian subcontinent commenced in the year 1858, ending in 1947. Britain's adventurous presence in India is replete with the allure and charm of luxurious and exotic diamonds, of mystical secrets transcribed in ancient manuscripts guarded by wise men. What is not so well celebrated, however, is the undercurrent of heroic efforts made by Indians of all faiths and conviction to rid themselves of the common oppressor and the exploitative stranglehold of the British administration. Sometime around the year 1877, in the city of Sialkot, a middle-class household was given the glad tiding of a newborn baby. His name was Muhammad Iqbal and he was to become the fifth son of Sheikh Noor Muhammad and Imam Bibi. The family were descendants of Hindu Brahmins who had emigrated from the valleys of Kashmir before converting to Islam. Sheikh Noor Muhammad, a tailor by trade and a devout believer, earned sufficient provision to furnish his newborn son with food, shelter and basic education. Like many of his contemporaries in the Indian Muslim society of his day, Muhammad Iqbal received his formal education at a local maktab. The child would soon be instructed and taught to read and write in several subjects under his mentor and advisor, Sayyid Mir Hassan, under whom the young student learned the glorious Quran, also reading Urdu and Persian poetry as well as Arabic classical poetry. The glowing intellect of Iqbal had kindled hope and anticipation in the mind of his teacher, who saw it fit to encourage the boy's parents to send him to a state school for a modern education. Later on he attended many other institutions, wherein he successfully earned a diploma from the faculties of art at Murray College followed by a Bachelor of Arts in Philosophy from the Government College in Lahore, where in the year 1897 he completed his studies in English Literature and the Arabic Language. Muhammad Iqbal was an intelligent and dedicated pupil. Soon after earning an honours degree in Arabic and English Literature, followed by his Master's degree in Philosophy, the young scholar, only 23 years of age, became a lecturer teaching Arabic at the Oriental College in Lahore.
in recognition and appreciation of his brilliant academic track record, he was granted a full scholarship to attend Trinity College in Cambridge, where he graduated with a Bachelor of Arts. Thereafter, he travelled to Germany, where he studied and earned his doctorate degree on the development of continental philosophy. His thesis was on the subject of Persian metaphysics, and he was awarded the degree from the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich, Germany. He returned to Britain, where he was called to the bar as London's Lincoln Inn, subsequently qualifying as a barrister. Mohammed Iqbal's experience in Europe granted him a unique insight and opportunity to observe the cultural norms of the Occidental world. Impressed by their work ethic, the young men soon realized that it was by virtue of their inquisitive minds and the desire to explore and challenge the force of nature that Europeans made such great advancements in science and philosophy. His study of Western classics, such as Goethe and Nietzsche in particular, also left an indelible mark on the thought and meditation of Muhammad Iqbal. He was not very fond <coughs> of Kant. He thought he was too German and too rigorous. Uh, but, uh, and Hegel influenced him to a certain extent. He was very influenced by Nietzsche, mm -hmm. <coughs> but only to a certain extent, because he could not accept uh, Nietzsche's uh, denial of God mm -hmm. and the Superman. Many scholars have thought that Iqbal's Mar the Mormon, yani the true Mormon, uh, was uh, an adaptation of uh, Nietzsche's Superman, but in reality, Nietzsche's Superman appears only after God has died. And how could Iqbal, as a Muslim, think have the idea that God should have died, impossible. For him, the superman is the man who is closest to God. Mm -hmm. And that is his great contribution. But on the whole, I think the influence of Goethe was strongest on him, the build-up of his mind. And then, of course, when he wrote his visionary Mi'araj, he was influenced by Milton, Paradise Lost, and he was also influenced by Dante's Divine Comedy. Mm -hmm. uh, so he has a number of European influences, uh, but he had put them together in a very, very beautiful way, and his main wish is uh, to revive the Muslims to a higher consciousness. He thinks the Muslims have dwelt too long in the fragrant gardens of Iran, and he called them to come back to the deserts of Arabia to learn a little bit fighting for life, which is an interesting point. However, despite these materialistic developments, he lamented the fact that Europe was still severely stricken by the malaise and maladies of inborn racism, extreme materialism, and a prevalent culture of competitiveness, exasperated by popular theories such as Darwin's survival of the fittest. If Europe had surpassed the world in terms of science and philosophy, he remarked, it was at the expense of spiritual and moral advancement. This, he opined, was not a cause for celebration. A powerful civilization, blessed with material means, but deprived of spiritual wealth and the guiding light of faith, was as much a threat to herself as she was unto any other, as proven by the unprecedented loss of lives witnessed during both world wars. In the lengthening days of March, the Germans extended their attacks to the west bank of the Meuse and to a hill with the sinister name of Mort Um, Dead Man. As the Ottoman Caliphate was on its deathbed and the Muslim world experienced the degenerative effects of stagnation, subjugation and hopelessness, Muhammad Iqbal's nationalistic affection dissolved as he contemplated and mused about all the factors, both internal and external, that had conspired and contributed towards the gradual downfall of the Muslim Ummah. Thus, during a transformative and critical period in the life of Muhammad Iqbal, 
his thoughts were reconnected with the faint yet still beating heart of the Muslim civilization. He began concentrating intensely on the study of Islam, expounding on the cultural and historical importance of Islamic civilization in an attempt to resuscitate the heartbeat of a once proud and glorious people. Through the powerful and eloquent medium of poetry, he spoke of the invigorating and spiritual force of Islam and how it would be sufficient to rescue humanity from continuing its rapid course towards self-destruction. His poetry was transformed during this pivotal phase of his life. He began to talk of unity between all Muslims, emphasizing the principle of being one Ummah while disavowing nationalism and political schism. Muhammad Iqbal returned to his homeland in the year 1908, joining his old college as a professor of philosophy and English literature. However, driven by the dissatisfaction of working under the British administration, he began practicing law on a temporary basis, making enough to support himself and his family. The Muhammad Iqbal who had returned to India was a transformed soul. His literary activities began to overshadow all other pursuits as he dedicated more of his time and efforts towards the composition of poetry, for which he soon captivated the attention of the nation when he wrote his famous poem, Shikwa, in the literary form of a complaint directed to God. क्यों जियाकार बनूं सूद फरामोश रहूं फिक्रे फरदा न करूं महवे गमे दोष रहूं नाले बुलबुल के सुनूं और हमतन गोश रहूं हम नवा मैं भी कोई गुल हूं के खामोश रहूं जुरत आमोद मेरी ताबे सुखन है मुझको Allama Iqbal's blossoming passion and zeal for Islam and the Muslim civilization was demonstrated by his increasing use of the Urdu and Persian languages with which he composed much of his later poetry reviving a collective spirit of hope and dignity across the Muslim world Although the call for a partition of India between Hindu and Muslims was already common, it was the support and advocacy of Allama Iqbal that marked significant changes to the movement. He became increasingly involved in the political, intellectual and social cause on behalf of India's Muslim minority, serving as a member of the All Indian Muslim League and delivering many influential lectures, most notably the iconic speech delivered to a vast crowd in Allahabad in the year 1930. Iqbal was convinced that if the Muslim minority remained a part of India, they would face imminent threats from the majority Hindu population. His vision and concern for the Muslims of India were the subject of an ongoing correspondence with Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who had been living in England for several years. Iqbal initiated contact with Jinnah encouraging him to return to India and assume leadership of the All Indian Muslim League. Jinnah, who was at first reticent and skeptical about Iqbal's ambitious project to create a new homeland for the Muslims of India, was soon convinced himself of the urgency of the matter, resulting from the mounting threats and hostilities directed to the Muslims of India by the hands of Hindu opposition, headed by a number of right-wing congressional leaders. Thus Muhammad Ali Jinnah and Allama Iqbal were united in purpose and began to pursue the same objective. Though it was quite clear that Iqbal's Islamic motivations were not entirely shared by Jinnah, who was more of an advocate and champion 
for political sovereignty and secular reform. Muhammad Iqbal was the poet and thinker who used his pen to transform the hearts and hopes of a nation under siege, rescuing it from the dangers of ineptitude and ignorance of self. He was also distinguished for his philosophical and academic contributions, particularly on the core concept of Khudi, which can be loosely translated as the ego, and has often been compared to Nietzsche's concept of a superman. His first major work in Persian was the Asrar of Khudi, as the mysteries of the self. Khudi is a word which is very difficult to translate. It had usually a negative connotation in Urdu and Persian as selfishness, egotism, but in Iqbal's work it becomes the essence of the human being which should be developed in a positive way. His services and counsel were sought far and wide. In fact, it is well documented that Mahatma Gandhi had invited Iqbal to serve as a teacher in one of India's institutions and that by the year 1922 Muhammad Iqbal had received a knighthood from King George of Great Britain who conferred upon him the prestigious title of Sir Muhammad Iqbal. Sir Muhammad Iqbal drew closer to his final day on earth in the year 1933, shortly after returning home from an international trip to Spain and Afghanistan. He was struck with an unknown form of throat illness. Following several months of discomfort and deteriorating health, he eventually died of the illness on April 21st in the year 1938. Unable to witness the historic day in 1947 when millions of Indian Muslims would finally reach the promised land for which he advocated, wrote for and campaigned so sincerely and passionately in what came to be known as Pakistan. Now, that you have now cut out its territory. What 
territory. It is all yours. It doesn't belong to a Punjabi or a Bengali or a Sindhi. It's yours. You've got your central government where every unit and every province is represented. Therefore, therefore, if you want to build up uh, yourself into a nation and get rid of this poison, God's sake, give up this provincialism.